Hello and welcome. My name is Abigail Freeman and I'm a WashU graduate. I earned my master's in 2011 and PhD in 2014, both working with today's moderator, Professor Ray Arvidson in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. I'm currently a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the deputy project scientist for the Curiosity Mars rover mission. On behalf of the WashU Alumni Association, I am so excited to welcome you to the Sirens of Mars, a book talk about searching for life on another world with two outstanding members of the WashU community. Before we begin, I'd like to explain the format for today's session. You will only hear and see me and our presenters. Following the conversation, we'll have time for questions. We encourage you to participate by asking questions at any time by typing in the question and answer box. Thank you to all of you who have submitted questions via your registration. During the Q&A session, we'll get to as many questions as we can. And in total, the webinar will last about one hour. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Alumni Association YouTube channel following the event. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce and to welcome Professor Raymond Arvidson, the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Professor Arvidson received a PhD from Brown University in 1974, and his career has focused on teaching and research about current and past environments on the Earth Mars and Venus. He is the director of the NASA Planetary Data System Geosciences Node, making available 300 terabytes of lunar and planetary data to the worldwide research community. He is also a fellow of the Geological Society of America and the American Geophysical Union, received the American Geophysical Union's Whipple Award, has received three NASA Public Service Medals and several dozen citations for excellence for his work in planetary orbital and land admission. Besides his contributions to science and to planetary exploration, Ray has also been honored by the state of Missouri for his excellence in teaching. And I can say from firsthand experience that he's an outstanding mentor for both the undergraduate and graduate students at WashU. Uh, his mentorship made an impact on my life as it has also for today's speaker, which I'm sure you'll hear more about shortly. So please join me in welcoming Professor Raymond Arvidson. Thanks so much, Abby. Abby was one of my favorite PhD students and Sarah Stewart Johnson, our guest today was one of my very favorite undergraduates. Boy, how to um, go through Sarah in terms of what she's done. She was an outstanding undergraduate uh, getting an AB, I think in 2001. When Sarah came to me as a freshman, we got her into what's called the ULIT program in environmental sustainability. And she tore through that at lightning speed. You know, when you, when you advise undergraduates um, during the semester in terms of what they might sign up for, what they might major in, uh, where, their, where their life will take them, it takes maybe 30 minutes. Advising Sarah took like three hours per pop. And it was like going through an onion skin all the way from the outside down to the core. So she graduated, that's for sure. She was outstanding. She was a Rhodes Scholar. She went to Oxford, got another bachelor's and master's. She had a PhD at MIT. She had done outstanding work on the dynamics of the Mars atmosphere and how it would get warm and wet, you know, back a few years ago. She was a, a White House fellow. She was a Harvard fellow. And she's now an associate professor at Georgetown University receiving tenure, I think Sarah last year outstanding researcher, interested in life on other planets, and has worked with the folks at Goddard in a planetary lab. And most importantly, and I have to read this, I'm gonna kind of pop over here. She um, is a recipient of a $7 million uh, grant for a laboratory for agnostic biosignatures, which Sarah, you'll have to explain exactly what that means. It's a NASA funded our research effort with a number of universities involved, but she's the big boss. And her recent book, The Sirens of Mars, Searching for Life in Another World, in fact, was the New York Times editor's choice and selected as by the New York Times as one of the 100 notable books of 2020. I could go on and talk to, about Sarah for, for a long time, <laughs> but it's time to introduce her. So Sarah, welcome to this, this session, and I think we'll have a lot of fun. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Ray. That was such a kind, 
kind introduction. Um, it's just thrilling to be here with, with the both of you and with all of our alumni from WashU. And, um, and so I thought I might just start by doing a, a quick reading from the book. But before I did, Ray, since you've sort of handed me the proverbial microphone, I just want to take a second and just express the deepest gratitude that I have in my heart for everything that you've done for me. I mean, I just, when I think about the evolution of my life, like, you know, just forget just being a scientist. Like I would not be the person who I am without Ray Arvidson. You know, I showed up at WashU, this kid from Kentucky, I barely ever crossed the state line. I had no idea what I was doing or where I was going or what was going to happen with my life. And Ray just totally, you took me in, you took care of me, you sat and talked to me for three hours at a time about what stupid classes I was going to take. And you just inspired me, you know, and, and it's just, it's been incredible. And, and what Abby said too, you know, it's not just me and Abby, it's this entire bevy of students, you know, not for nothing. You can't go to one of these Mars meetings without taking like three steps and running into another one of Ray's students. And, and now that I am a professor, you know, right, when I think about what I want to leave behind, you know, you've been such an inspiration you know I just want my legacy to look like yours where you know it's not only science but it's also just this incredible culture of teaching and mentoring and shaping these young lives so anyway you're just you're just wonderful and I'm just so excited to be sharing this stage with you and thank you for everything that you've done for me um okay so I will I guess I will start to to read I think I'm just going to read a, a couple of pages from the prologue and then we can get into questions because that'll be more fun. Um, but this is this book that I wrote. It's called The Sirens of Mars and it's uh, Searching for Life on Another World. And I thought I would just read a couple of paragraphs here from the prologue. Okay, so it's a peculiar band I've joined, this pack of Mars scientists fiercely bound across the generations by the enigma of a neighboring world. One might fairly wonder why we have pinned our hopes for finding life to this red planet. For the last couple of billion years, there's been no rain there. There are no rivers, no lakes, no oceans. Without the driving force of fluid erosion, scars left over millions of years by meteorites are strewn across the surface. Mars has no plate tectonics, no magnetic field, and little protective atmosphere. The terrain is quiet, exposed, and bewilderingly empty. Yet long ago, before it rested over, Mars was much more like Earth, smaller, but similar in size and elemental composition. In its early days, Mark was black. Mars was black with igneous basalt. Untold piles of lava built the planet's massive volcanic provinces, which bulged with enough basalt to flex the crust. The planet's swollen side cracked open as Mars cooled with a fissure so deep that the Grand Canyon could disappear into a side channel. One of the largest mountains in the solar system was formed, towering over an escarpment that itself was nearly as tall as Everest. These volcanoes lifted greenhouse gases into the air, wrapping the surface with a blanket of atmosphere. We know from the geologic record that the terrain was warm and wet, at least periodically. And around the time life may have been getting started here, conceivably in volcanic pools in Darwin's warm little ponds, water was present on Mars, pregnant with possibility. In fact, there may have been enough water to fill a northern ocean, still and deep, with a sea floor as smooth and flat as the abyssal plains of the Great Pacific. Then between three and a half and four billion years ago, our planetary past diverged and Mars was laid bare. Almost all of the atmosphere disappeared and so did the water. The planet slipped into a deep freeze colder than the cold of Antarctica, leaving Mars the hyper-arid frozen desert we know today, bathed in high energy solar and cosmic radiation. Now a dust, the consistency of red flower coats the surface, lofted by dust devils into the impossibly thin air. Yet life we have learned is stunningly resilient. It can adapt, it can wedge into a crevasse, it can hang on against all odds, 
and it can reveal itself in unlikely ways. Traces of biology hide in the most unexpected locations. It's why I roam the terrain at the edge of the world, hunting for the subtlest fingerprints of life, learning how to look. In the far reaches of Australia, there's one particular lake that stands apart from the others, amid the rocks and the dunes, past the rabbit-proof fence in the Jabadi Nature Reserve, past the derelict aerodrome. The surface is stippled with halite, a form of table salt that looks like freshly fallen snow. In the right place with a good grip, you can pull out a crystal of gypsum, severed like a shark's tooth from the jaw of the earth. The spear-tipped blades are as large as your hand. When you rinse away the red mud and hold it to the light, it flashes in the sun like a gemstone. Under a microscope, you can see the tiniest pockets within it, glinting drops of lake water sheathed in mineral hideaways, life caught in a crystalline dagger. These prismatic inclusions are just one of the many features we wanna look for on Mars. We are seeking places where secrets are held, where the traces of life might be preserved and protected. For over 50 years, we've been exploring Mars with telescopes, flyby missions, orbiters, landers, and rovers. We've scoured the surface for current life, as well as for indications of past life, for possibilities and actualities. The strange, wild, the wild strangeness of this planet with its tawny air and its relentless red deserts calls to us. With each mission, we grapple to understand a world that's at once recognizable, yet at the same time, indescribably foreign. We return again and again, and the mysteries deepen. In the process, we built an entire field of science around something we can barely see in the night. 400 years ago, Mars was still a blaze of light, no more than an idea. The earliest telescopes showed it as large as a pea held at arm's length. And even more modern telescopes gave us little to go on. We had no idea what the surface looked like or what it was made of, or if there were mountains or valleys. We had only the crudest of maps. We didn't know if there were clouds or what color the sky was. We started from almost nothing. We've gone careening down blind alleys and taken countless wrong turns, yet somehow, miraculously, the passion, ingenuity, and persistence we've brought to the enterprise have moved us to a truer understanding of this other world. In this way, the story of Mars is also a story about Earth, how we've start, sought another stirring of life in the universe and what that search has come to mean. Mars has been our mirror, our foil, a telltale reflection of what has been deepest in our hearts. We have seen in Mars a utopia, a wilderness, a sanctuary, an oracle. With so few landmarks, guideposts, or constraints, all is possible. Without data that could be used to cabin our inquiry or limit our imagination, Mars has been a blank canvas, and tenderly, our human seeking has rushed to fill it. Sarah, that is uh, well done. And it's kind of like your undergraduate career. You're interested in so many things. You know, from science to mathematics, to computer sciences, to literature, to religion. Gosh, one of the questions that came in um, pre-chat, pre this session, was how do you balance writing and science and all the other things that you're interested in? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I think you probably know this about me, but ever since I was this little child. I've just always been scribbling things down. And um, I kept a journal when I was in college. And, and I've always loved writing, but I never ever really wrote with any sense of audience. Um, it was only sort of long after I got my PhD and I was working on a postdoc that I just, for the first time, I was taking sort of a creative writing class just for fun. And um, and an essay that I wrote ended up getting picked up by the professor and published in a, a literary journal. And um, I don't know, it was the first time that I really thought of myself as more than just kind of a, a hobby writer. <laughs> um, and this idea for the book ended up just coming out of just, there are all of these things that, uh, that I would I would notice, you know, we'd be at these conferences together and we'd be listening to these talks and there would be just these, 
tidbits of information, little things that just struck me as, you know, beautiful or evocative or compelling, but the sorts of things that would probably never find expression on the pages of scientific journals, you know, I don't know about you guys, but you know, looking for inspiration, you're probably not going to sort of the geophysical research letters to in your spare time, read some creative writing. Um, but I just wanted to sort of start collecting some of these ideas together because, you know, our exploration of Mars, like there's a scientific story, but it's also very much a, a human story and, and what we bring to the table. Um, but I, I think it's been great, actually, you know, so I started writing this book, I don't know, years ago, and it was sort of on the back burner, you know, I pick it up sometimes on the weekends or, or late at night, I've got little children, and sometimes if they'd wake me up in the middle of the night, I'd, I couldn't go back to sleep, and I'd spend some time writing, but it's been, it's been great, because I think it's actually ended up influencing my, my science and in a pretty big way. Like even this grant, the, the one you mentioned, the Laboratory for Agnostic Biosignatures Project, it's, it's the project I feel like I'm most excited about right now. I mean, there are lots of projects that I love, but this one is just, the idea really is to try to think about how we could look for life without assuming that it's like us, you know, without assuming a particular molecular framework or an underlying biochemistry that would be like yes, there are Actually, there's a question on chat that gets- Oh, okay, sorry. That. And the question is, are we too focused on Mars? You know, are we, we spending basically too much time and money exploring our, you know, our, our red planet and not thinking about life more generally across the rest of the solar system and the universe? So what do you think? Oh, well, I think that I want to explore all of these destinations. And of course, it's not just Mars here in our own solar system. We have these ocean worlds, Titan, Europa, Enceladus, all of these other moons of outer planets that are really exciting destinations for astrobiology. And then of course, now this whole universe of exoplanets is starting to open up as well. Um, one of the things I will say is I think our, our chances for a, a sort of, I don't know, I'm a restless sort of person, as you know, and the chances of finding life, I feel like are, are we have a good shot on Mars. You know, we know that Mars was, you know, very similar to Earth early in its history. And well, we can also just do such good science on Mars, right? We can land such large missions yeah. and it's quick to get there. Because remember, Curiosity landed with the retrovirus blasting out the um, regolith and exposed river conglomerates. So we landed on an old alluvial fan that, where the material was transported by water. And the more we drive with, with Curiosity, the better it looks. You know, we're currently sitting on some lake beds that have organics, and we're about to transition up into some salt deposits, probably sulfate related. So I think the reason we're doing Mars is it's close, we can do it. And gosh, it was Earth-like, as you said, early in geologic time, but it just kind of, being a small planet, kind of cooled down and it, it lost its own, <laughs> lost most of its atmosphere. But because of that, you know, all the rocks and the geomorphology, you know, shows what was happening billions of years ago, which we can't see on the Earth. But that doesn't mean we should, as you said, you know, give up on a, on a wider search. So what is, what is the point of saying ag agnostic in your new laboratory? <laughs> Oh, so again, just sort of instead of life as we know it, but more like life as we don't know it, you know, sort of without, you know, particular classes of molecules looking sort of more broadly for things like signs of complexity or energy transfer, or sort of accumulations of elements or isotopes. And, and I guess just one of the things I was just going to say quickly was, I think that this process of writing this book was so formative for me just in the process of pulling together that proposal and that project because I think if there's anything that we've learned by looking at the history of Mars science it's that we have continually gone careening down blind alleys there have been so many twists and turns and we've we've assumed that Mars is earth-like just to be bowled over by just how indescribably foreign it actually is and I think that, you know, we've maybe we're making some of those assumptions even now as we're searching for life, you know, looking for life like ours, you know, because Mars isn't Earth, you know, it's a, it's just, it's truly alien. And I think that that was something that I, I really came to appreciate in the process of, of working on this, this project, this book. 
<laughs> well, in a sense, it's alien, but the landscapes are eerily Earth-like, right? What's behind me, as uh, you might recognize, is a mosaic from the Opportunity rover as it was climbing a very, very old crater rim. And it's toward twilight, which is the reason you don't see many shadows, but you can see the tracks. I'm always amazed, you know, when we, when we drive with curiosity, maybe 100 meters, and there's a brand new landscape. And I show it to some of my colleagues and I say, where do you think we are in the Mojave Desert? And not realizing that it's actually Mars. So it's both alien and not. It's eerily Earth-like in many, many respects. But, you know, today it's totally frozen because it just doesn't have those juices coming out of the, the atmosphere from the volcanoes anymore. Can we talk about part of the book where you go through the Viking landers? Oh, sure. And, and I was actually part of that in a, in a way as a graduate student. You know, for the, for the folks on the webinar, the US for the bicentennial landed two Viking landers on the surface of Mars in 1976. And I was involved, believe it or not, in the imaging experiments, but there were also biology experiments and basically looking at the regolith, the soil, if you will, and using a scoop and an arm to bring that soil back into the, into the lander and doing biological experiments. And by, by and far, with the exception of maybe one or two scientists, we think we found alien soil and not any evidence of biology. So one, one question that was asked both on, on um, the questions that came in before the, the webinar and then I thought of is in retrospect, you know, going back to the 60s and early 70s when the landers were designed and the experiments were designed, can you think of anything that we should have done differently? Or did we just kind of do kind of a brute force based on what we know? You know, realizing that in the, in the 1960s, people were still drawing canals on Mars maps. Yeah, well, and especially if you look at, you know, the last 50 years of biology, just how incredibly revolutionized our understanding of what life even is has, has become, you know, like we were making a lot of assumptions, but I mean, it was of course the best science of the day about what sort of life we might find. And, and so this biology package, it was really going after metabolism. And the idea was that, you know, you could take these organisms and if you had tiny little microbes, you know, you could put them into sort of a tiny spacecraft laboratory and hopefully you would be able to see respiration, evidence of growth. And we were making that assumption, you know, based on the idea that we could bring organisms into the laboratory and we can't actually do that. You know, one of the things that we've discovered in the past few decades is that 99% of the biological diversity that we have on our planet, all of those incredible microbes, you bring them into a laboratory and you can't culture them up in isolation. You can't make them grow. And we had these ideas like Vance Oyama, one of his famous experiments was called the sort of chicken soup experiment. I'm sure you're more familiar with this than I am, Ray, but it was just this idea, throw in like a ton of sugar, a nutrient broth, that's the chicken soup, and then just wait. And these microbes should be so happy, right? They've been starved, they're on Mars, it's cold. And, but like we now know that even in places that have lots of life here on our own planet, like in the Atacama Desert or the Antarctic Dry Valleys, like you could try to run those experiments and they wouldn't actually work. And so I think if we were designing those experiments, we design them differently today. But I think it, you know, it's just, we have this progression of where we are with our own understanding of what life is, what are the limits of life, how we might find it. And then we also have to like really push on, you know, maybe there are things that are even beyond the confines of our imagination right now that we really need to try to embrace. Yeah, so the Viking biology experiments, Sarah, as you know, we're digging around in the modern sand and regolith and soil, but that's modern stuff. And, and of course, they, with a the thin atmosphere and no magnetic field, radiation gets right to the surface, you know, cosmic rays. So we now know that those materials would be sterilized, you know, in retrospect. And that's the reason we're going for the ancient rocks, you know, where the geomorphology and the other pieces of evidence say, whoa, you know, it was warm and wet early, but the whole kind of environment today is incredibly cold. That, that view behind me, you know, that taken by opportunity, temperature there was way, way below freezing. The atmospheric density was one one hundredth of Earth's. 
It's all carbon dioxide with a few other things. So today's not a vacation spot. You know, it's not a place where you'd go to find life in the in the surface. We're looking for biosignatures, right, in the rocks. And we're beginning to find some evidence for them. But could you explain to the folks on the webinar what the heck is a biosignature? Oh, so biosignature, it's just kind of a fancy way of saying traces of life or fingerprints of life. And, and these things, you know, they might be something like I've got this lovely fossil that one of my students gave me. So this is a biosignature, a fossil that you might see here on Earth. We, um, we are probably not going to find anything this complex on Mars because even in our... We probably won't find it. <laughs> our, our own history, you know, we didn't have body fossils like that until just like the very last chapter of our kind of evolutionary journey. But, um, but there's a sort of molecular version of that, you know, there are these complex molecules that are associated with life that we might find, that we might be able to find. Um, but biosignatures can also take the form of, you know, isotopic measurements, they can be biogenic minerals even, you know, just anything that could show you evidence of life. Um, and, you know, so they're kind of ancient biosignatures, which of course is the goal of the Perseverance mission, which is going to land on Thursday. And then there are sort of these extant biosignatures. And I'm so glad you mentioned the radiation. You know, it's so tricky for molecules and, and just for anything. If I was a little microbe on the surface of Mars, I certainly would have retreated into the subsurface where only two meters down, you get a lot of protection from those cosmic rays. And, and so I'm excited to see there's another mission that the Europeans are sending that's going to arrive in 2023. That's going to, of course, drill down for our audience members down into um, the subsurface between oxy plan them. And that should be really exciting as well to see what kind of comes up from down at those depths. Yeah, that's a rover called ExoMars for the folks on the webinar. And it's a joint European Space Agency and Russian Space Agency rover that would be very, very capable. They just couldn't meet the um, timeline for a launch last summer because of COVID. And of course, there are 13 different countries involved with instruments and capabilities. So organizing that was just impossible. So they slipped a launch by two years. But they'll get there. And of course, we have a, a Chinese orbiter and a, ran, ran, a lander and a rover in orbit. And we have the European, I'm sorry, the United Arab Emirates Hope orbiter in orbit. So Mars is a popular destination. <laughs> what do you think about terraforming Mars? Is it possible or is it kind of a grand idea that's kind of up in the clouds? Oh, terraforming. Um, so this is the idea that we could take Mars, you know, this kind of rusted old husk of a world and try to make it back the way it was early in its history, try to make it more Earth-like. Um, and there are all kinds of really fascinating ideas. You know, we could spread soot on the polar caps and sort of <laughs> melt them. And like the gases would, you know, those volatiles could help build up the atmosphere and, and make some greenhouse gases. You could have some bioengineered bacteria and we could kind of lace them throughout the soil and try to do all kinds of things there. Um, it's sort of incredible. I mean, there's a whole actual a textbook on terraforming that I've, I've actually seen um, in real life. So, I mean, th there are like, ideas there. Um, but of course, the time scales for this sort of thing are, are just impossibly long, you know, hundreds or thousands of okay. years. And I, I do sort of wonder about, you know, the well, state. Of I, I wonder about terraforming. Because remember back to our freshman course, uh, land dynamics, where we talked about the carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. So you have to have um, in the earth in terms of, of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide is pretty important. So it's coming out of volcanoes and then it's consumed by weathering. So it's a cycle. And then this process called plate tectonics is involved. But the cycle is kind of stopped on Mars, right? I mean, there's not a lot of, of greenhouse gas coming out from volcanoes. So you can put things into the atmosphere, but aren't they gonna weather and combine with the gases and put it back down into the surface? And there's no way to get the gases back out. Yeah, so I just wonder so about the reality of despite the fact that there are books written about terraforming, you know, whether well, it's a long-term kind of reality. Well, and I think the thing to remember is, you know, the atmospheric pressure on Mars, it's just, you know, less than 1% of what it is here and just really build up enough of those gases. It's just, it's kind of just a, a very, very, very hard challenge. Um, and 
I don't know, you know, but I, I feel, I guess, a, a little reluctant to sort of say never. I mean, I think about where we were even just 100 years ago with the state of Mars science and just how even the possibility of being able to explore Mars, you know, it's just such science fiction to, to go there, the idea of any kind of in situ science instead of just seeing it from afar through a telescope. But, you know, technology has gotten us. Oh, I don't know, Ray. Like, I do think it's probably quite crazy. And I think, um, you know, we'd probably much better serve to invest those resources to keeping our own planet from, <laughs> from terraforming our own planet. You know, we're, we're massively changing going. these huge <laughs> physical systems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sarah, of course, for humans, you know, should we be going to Mars? I mean, NASA and some of the other national space agencies, the long-term goal is to put some astronauts or cosmonauts or whatever they're called on the surface of Mars to demonstrate that we can do it and to do exploration. By the time that happens, you know, there are huge impediments, the radiation dose in space, the radiation dose on the surface. Turns out if you eat a lot of broccoli, it helps with radiation damage. You can almost imagine, you know, the six month journey in a, in a space capsule with a Talking behind a whole garden of broccoli. <laughs> Actually, it was a Harvard study that suggested this is this is a way to minimize radiation dose. But should we be sending humans to the planet? Um, by the time that happens, maybe I don't know, 30 years or so, there are many impediments. You know, robotics will have increased in capability so much, we can almost do what humans do now. So maybe it's a, a different view where there are humans involved in robotics you know, robotic systems kind of working alongside. What do you think the whole idea of, about the whole idea of um, sending humans to the red planet and why? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. I think there are lots of kind of factors to consider. Like on the one hand, like I, nothing we've made in sort of our entire sophistication of AI and all that is, has ever come close to the, you know, the complexity and the power of a human brain. And the idea that you could kind of set down a geologist in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, they would still have a much better chance of finding that dinosaur bone than even our most capable robotic systems. You know, you put that a few decades into the future, maybe that line gets a little bit more blurred. But I think the real question is, like, is it, is it for science that we would go and, and, or is it kind of for something else, you know, like, I mean, are there other reasons that humans explore space and humans actually go out to the very limits of, of our planet and, the, you know, why we've climbed the highest mountains and gone to the bottom of the ocean. It's inherent in our psyche. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there's something to it. And I think that there's just something kind of in us as a species that drives us out to these really, these really kind of empty places. And I think that that's, that's sort of part of it. And I, I do think that humans will go at some point, you know, and I don't know if that's like a, a big international mission with lots of collaboration led by science or if it's a private company or if it's you know sort of a new space race that actually gets us there but I do think it's on the horizon. It's an opportunity for international cooperation in a peaceful way and, and there's a lot of interest you know rovers and the images they take are like your cousins off in Mongolia or something right so really you can personify with the landscapes. You may remember when Spirit and Opportunity landed in 2004 uh, those were the, the two rovers called the Mars Exploration Rovers. And I was traveling, we were out at, in, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and I went to Los Angeles International Airport, and there was, I walked past one of the restaurants, and there was a drink named after Spirit, right? And it was all chocolatey and kind of red, like the Mars color. And then long after that, I was in China, in, in a bizarre place, the easternmost part of China, at um, a park and walking along with, with some of my Chinese colleagues from the university, this guy stepped up to me and asked through a translator, how is spirit doing? I understand <laughs> one of the wheels is broken. And this was just a random person in China. So, you know, we had followings for spirit, for opportunity, for the Phoenix lander in 2008, and certainly for curiosity who follow everything we do and actually question among themselves why we turned right, why we turned left. <laughs> they take the data that, that we release on the web as soon as we acquire the data and they make their own mosaic. So there's a lot of interest 
you know, in exploring this planet. And in fact, I think exploring any planet um, or any moon, you know, if you can see things the way people do, like you're on vacation. So I think there's a lot of interest in, in exploration, whether it's robotic or, or human. And time will tell exactly how that kind of parses out, in my opinion. What else should we talk about? Uh, what else do you want to talk about, Ray? Okay, let me go through some Maybe the questions. audience members have some questions. I don't know, whatever you okay, want. Okay, here, here's one. <laughs> what led you to pursue the field of planetary science? Oh, you. <laughs> yeah, I just, I. <laughs> John said, no one can tell you what to do. All I did was to point you and give you options and you gobbled them all up. But what it is about the planetary sciences field that, that really is kind of floats your boat, if you will. Uh, I mean, it's just so great. Like, it's just, I mean, we're out exploring these places, you know, we're sending these spacecraft built by human hands, like off into the depths of the cosmos. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible field. And I mean, I think for me, this question of, you know, are we alone? Like, are we alone in this dark night? And is it, you know, is it just like we have life on this planet, which we know is ephemeral. We know at some point, you know, our planet is going to go away. Our sun is going to explode. Like there will be an end of our solar system. But, you know, like for me, this idea that we're potentially bound by like an abiotic before and an abiotic after is the sort of lonely thought. And I think that if, even if I could just know, like through, before the end of my lifetime, that there was another data point, you know, another spark of life and especially if we found it right on Mars you know right next door here in our corner of the solar system I mean if lightning struck twice and we had a separate genesis that close I think it would just really suggest that the the universe was just full of full of different possibilities and, and that it wasn't just chemistry but also biology out there. You know, there has been discussion since you know meteorites are exchanged between Earth and Mars you can go to Antarctica and you pick up these black rocks. Some small fraction of them, when you put them in the laboratory, smell like Mars atmosphere, right? Through mass spectrometry, you, you can't really smell them. But they have, <laughs> have compositions and isotopic con configurations of the Mars atmosphere. So we know there are some meteorites from Mars. But they would be more blasted off if and when, you know, back in the day, when life got started and still existed close to the surface, we could have been transporting some microbes to Earth, right? Yeah, we could. I mean, there were a billion tons of rocks that we think were exchanged between these two planets. We might have kind of caught life from the next planet yeah. over. Um, it's certainly a possibility. I mean, actually, in that scenario, it'd be more likely that we were all Martians, that those rocks were coming from Mars and into the well of the gravitational well of the sun toward Earth. the public lectures, I usually talk about exchange of meteorites between the two planets and then pick out a couple of people in the audience, particular particularly students, high school students in particular that aren't paying attention. I say, I think you might have Mars atmosphere, Mars ancestry. <laughs> oh, I love it. But I mean, the great thing is like we have, we're just so, we've gotten so sophisticated at how we can look at life. I mean, we have these phylogenetic trees where we can pin every organism. And if we found, you know, a DNA based carbon based organism on Mars, we could immediately look at its DNA and say, okay, this is this common contaminant. We know this is in our spacecraft clean rooms, you know, when we're preparing the spacecraft, or we can say, my goodness, this is something deeply, deeply branching that looked like it diverged from the rest of the tree of life, you know, billions of years ago. And, and we know, and I mean, even that I think would be a tremendous opportunity. We could rerun the tape of evolution, you know, redo that great experiment and kind of see what, what happens, what turns out. But, but it's really this idea of a separate genesis that makes me so excited. So now some questions are coming in on chat. One of them is um, about the, the ultraviolet rays, the cosmic rays, you know, the, the, the particles coming in. How do you protect yourself against those? 
Oh, you can go underground is probably go underground, the best have property. Seriously, go find those lava tubes on Mars, you know, these ancient places where lava used to tunnel out these terrains. I mean, it's a pretty bleak scenario for human exploration to be down in the darkness, but I mean, that's probably the first place I'd go if I was a I human. I kind of look at it, you know, analogous <laughs> to Antarctica. Yeah. You know, with the exception of Chile and Argentina, nobody really owns or think, think they own um, Antarctica, but you know there are scientific research bases, and it's a it's a really harsh environment. Not as harsh as Mars, but it's used for scientific measurements and exploration. Maybe that's that's the way, you know, Mars ought to be thought of. And, and I think if and when humans go there, it will be cooperatively with really advanced robotic systems as compared to what we have today. Folks, I mean, for example, on Curiosity, we were doing planning today. That's the rover that touched down back in 2012, and it's powered by plutonium, so it's gone for a while. We only drive maybe 30 to 40 meters on a given day. It actually has the speed I calculated of a Galapagos tortoise <laughs> because of, of the computational limitations and the power limitations. Perseverance that lands hopefully well on Thursday of this week will go faster. It has faster computers, it has better algorithms, uh, and you know, there's their advances, but you imagine 30 years from now, what robotics will look like. So I, I envision human exploration of the red planet if it happens to be rather different than anything we'd, we'd think about today, but we'd still have the radiation problem that we'd have to take care of. Here's another question. Can we turn Mars back into an Earth-like planet? Oh, I think that's just getting at the heart of that terraforming idea. Yeah. Again, like I just think very, very exceedingly technically challenging. And here's a comment from a, from a, a participant. If we just had broccoli, then President George H.W. Bush wouldn't go. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Neither would my children. Let's see what else we have here. I'm looking through the, the ones that have been submitted early. Um, so here's a question specifically for you. Are you familiar with Len Kasten's book on interplanetary travel? Do you believe it's been done? Uh, what do you make of it? I haven't read it. Oh, I haven't read it either. Um, but I guess the idea is interplanetary travel, travel, like that people have been abducted. Is that the idea? Or I guess, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm actually not familiar with it. OK. Yeah, I'm going to pick out another one. Your experience at Washington University shaped your career path, question mark. I think that's uh, <laughs> Yes. Oh, here's a good one. This is from one of the webinar participants who's in oceanography. Just curious about water on Mars. Where is it? What form is it in? What happened to it? Oh, that's a great question. And actually, one of the biggest things we've kind of been grappling with, like, how much water, when was the water there? When did the water disappear? You know, and it's not that the water is fully disappeared, you know, even though we don't have rivers and oceans and lakes on Mars anymore, you know, we have polar caps, we have hydrated minerals, we have subsurface water, maybe thin films around mineral grains, you know, we found swimming pools and swimming pools and swimming pools right. worth of water. Um, still far less water than the earth, of course. Um, if we had the same amount of water as we have here on the earth, I'd suspect we would have met a Martian by now. <laughs> it's, it's been lost, right, by stripping from the solar wind. So it's really hard to estimate the initial content of water. You know, it, it's funny, when Spirit and Opportunity landed, as you know, the mantra was follow the water, find the water. And Spirit, by the time it finished, actually stop working around an old volcano, an ancient volcano, with the presence of both hydrothermal and fumarole deposits. And Opportunity landed in a crater and within five meters away on the rim, there were cross bedded rocks that formed in an ancient lake. And what's behind me, you know, that rim of the ancient crater called Endeavor, when we actually looked into the cracks, we found all sorts of evidence for hydrothermal alteration. So, Cure, it's opportunity and spirit. In 2008, we landed Phoenix above the Arctic Circle in the Northern Hemisphere. And we scraped away the, about maybe three or four inches of regolith and there were ice cubes under the surface. And they actually went to a gas phase in about two weeks because they're not stable. 
So there's, there's a lot of water ice and there are a lot of hydrated minerals. There's just not a lot of liquid water today, except maybe for brines. So, oh, all right. What about the subsurface lake down under the South Polar Lake? Oh, well, well, if you believe it, there's evidence <laughs> from radar for a subsurface um, water uh, body uh, beneath one of the polar caps. A maybe. mile down, 12 miles wide. I mean, right? aren't you yeah, fascinated yeah, by that? Yeah, yeah. Right, we'll see. I just want a big old drill and then we can go and we can <laughs> look at it. <laughs> you know, we so we're way beyond the water. The water is there. Oh, right? yeah. A lot of it's been lost. So now we're into, uh, our, what, were there habitable environments for Mars? And Curiosity says definitely yes. You know, there were water-laid environments. The water was on the, on the surface for an extended period of time. All the elements are there that would be needed. There was, there was something to eat in terms of the rocks. There was sunlight for photosynthesis. Now we need to kind of move on and as you know, Sarah, and see if there are biochemically relevant compounds biosignatures and any evidence for ancient life, which is the point of perseverance. Perseverance landing on Thursday in a big crater called Jezero with a big deltaic complex, kind of like the Mississippi Delta is today. And they will actually make in situ measurements, but importantly, kind of take a whole bunch of, of drill cores about like my, my pinky, and they'll eventually be returned to Sarah's lab and elsewhere where you can do experiments that you could, just couldn't do on a rover. And that's the real way to get at biosignatures. So we're moving from, oh, was there water? Sure enough, if all the water is done, habitability, the more we look, the better it looks. And now we're moving toward getting the samples back to the laboratory for a really detailed biosignature kind of analysis. So there's all progression. Right, that's gotta be so exciting for you and like all the other people that worked on those Viking missions. Cause you know, we were doing that. We were looking for life. And then we just had this 20 year hate as no Mars yeah. missions. And then yeah. we've just been sort of slowly building up since then. And we're finally, we have the context. We understand we've done the work. We know the planet, we know where to look. We kind of have ideas about how to look. I mean, it just must be thrilling to kind of see this come full circle. That's right. And it's not only Mars. I mean, there's a, a mission that NASA is funding through the, the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab called Dragonfly, which we're part of. And Dragonfly actually is a, helicopter, it's actually a quadcopter on Titan, which is one of the moons of Saturn, which is chock full of these bizarre organic uh, molecules. And it, it will jump from place to place to place because it can't really rove because there are oceans of methane and ethane. How bizarre is that? And a very dense atmosphere. Uh, Sarah, if we put you on Titan on the surface and gave you wings, the atmosphere is dense enough and the gravity is low enough that you could fly. Isn't that so weird? So it's getting at habitability and the presence of perhaps life, who knows? But I mean, in just such an Saturn. incredibly different world, you know, cause it's got a solvent, but it's not water, right? You've got these liquid hydrocarbons and you just kind of think about what would the molecular and polymeric building blocks of life look like in such an environment, you know? It's, it's just so different from what we're used to around here. <laughs> and webinar participants, you can see how we get pumped up with excitement about these possibilities. <laughs> even even the, the high atmosphere of Venus, right? Venus, it rains sulfuric acid, but it evaporates before it gets to the surface, has 90 times room pressure of carbon dioxide. It's warmer on the surface than you can make your oven, but researchers are still thinking about life in the clouds. Have you followed that, that whole kind of research effort? Oh my gosh, all the ping-ponging. I mean, it's been really quite extraordinary. I don't know if you've sat in on any of these conference sessions, right? <laughs> Where it's just like, look over here, look over here, look over here. So, you know, there's this detection initially back in the fall where a paper came out saying, you know, we found phosphine, this gas, which has been discussed as a potential biosignature for exoplanets for a long time. You know, right. one of these things, if we could see from telescopes on exoplanets, we'd be really excited because it seems like, you know, it's got such a short lifetime. So if there's a significant buildup of it in the atmosphere, there would have to be some disequilibrium process, either really weird chemistry or life um, as, a, as a byproduct of life. And then we found it on Venus. But then of course, there's been this whole back and forth. Did you really find it? Is it actually in the cloud deck? Is, is it too high? Is it not the altitude that it's supposed to be at to actually be coincident, coinciding with the clouds? 
all kinds of back and forth. But yeah, I think what's so exciting is it's right here. We can go test it. You know, Venus yeah, is right there. Trust us. If anyone submissions. comes up with something that might be a biosignature, they are roundly, roundly examined by the rest of the community. Because if you want to come up with something that exciting, you need to make sure that it's really the case. By the way, I forgot to mention, you know, Carl Sagan is part of your book. And I knew him. He was a fantastic gentleman and, and scholar. And he helped with a lot on the Viking landers. But do you know, Sarah, he actually did two things. He had NASA paint the landers with rubber paint because he thought that the saltating particles, the particles blown by the very thin wind might erode the vehicle. And the second thing he did, which was quite clever, he actually got the camera crew, which I was part of, to sequence periodic imaging of the same spot, just in case something walked by, we might be able to <laughs> capture it. But of course, the winds weren't strong enough to erode the vehicle. And as far as we could tell, after taking a lot of repeat images, we didn't see anything walk by. <laughs> Uh, I just think he's such an extraordinary person. I mean, the imagination that he brought to bear on Mars science, it was just really incredible thinking about his legacy. Yeah, he was a, he was a true gentleman. He's been to Washington, he was at Washington University a number of times. Uh, both, I have to tell you a story. We were in the same office when the Viking landers touched down at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, for the first three days of the mission, this is Viking Lander 1. And then his secretary came in and took all his stuff. I said, what the heck happened? So what happened, he was on the Johnny Carson show, the Tonight Show, right after the landing. And Johnny Carson apparently was a space buff. So in between commercials, that's called a slug. So Carl was supposed to be on for one slug. He wound up on multiple slugs, I think three slugs. And some of the, the famous stars couldn't get on that night. But that, that led to his um, just rocketing up in terms of, of not only being an excellent scientist, but also, you know, an excellent outreach person for the for the public, you know, which he, he just was an extraordinary person. And I was lucky, lucky enough to know him. He actually knew my first name. He called me Ray. I called him Carl. So it was a, a true, you know, relationship, colleague to colleague. And we've written papers together. Let's see, what else can we talk about? Let's see, what are the <laughs> So a nine-year-old asks if there have been any discoveries of microbial life so far on Mars. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so while there have been discoveries of microbial life all the time, every day here on Earth, we are finding all kinds of new things. We haven't yet found them up on Mars. And of course, that's why we're sending, you know, these missions, and we're going to continue to explore. Um, and I don't know, I selfishly hope it's my generation that makes that <laughs> Every, but it might be yours. And so you should, <laughs> you know, study hard and grow up and become a planetary scientist and an astrobiologist and go after these big questions. <laughs> it's a big planet. I mean, half the size of the earth, but what people don't realize it has the surface area equal to the continental surface area of the earth. So there's a lot to explore and a lot of complexities. You know, it evolved differently than the earth over geologic time, but it was earth-like early on, um, although not for a long period of time. But I mean, Ray, when you think about it, like, I mean, if you could, if you really had life and it really took hold on Mars back when it was a much more clement environment, I mean, just think about what it would take to kind of autoclave a planet. Like, I just feel like life is so <laughs> adaptable. Maybe it just retreated into the subsurface. We can autoclave maybe, maybe in a thousand years. <laughs> oh, here's a question right up your alley. And that is, if we find proof of, of life on other planets, such as Mars, maybe the clouds of Venus, maybe you know, the surface or the atmosphere of Titan, what are the positive and negative effects on Earthlings, knowing uh, that life is on other objects relative to our own? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's, that's a really good question too. I mean, so, Maybe on the negative side, it's sort of the same kind of thing that happened with the Copernican revolution, you know, it sort of pushed us, you know, we know that, you know, we're not the center of our solar system, we're not the center of our galaxy, we're not the center of our universe, we're just kind of off this distant speck and, and maybe we're not the center of biology. I mean, I, hopefully that's that's the case. Um, so maybe there's like a little bit of something lost there, but it just seems like the 
the incredible possibilities. You know, it's not just the sense of, you know, knowing for definitively for the first time that we aren't alone and that there are all kinds of different possibilities out there. I think it's also, there's just so much to learn. I mean, biology, despite all these incredible advances, I feel like it's still kind of a descriptive science. You know, it's, it's still sort of in its infancy. It doesn't kind of have those underlying laws of sort of chemistry and physics. You know, we just don't know much because we have this one data point. You know, even when we come to trying to define life, there's a philosopher that I admire who kind of talks about this idea that, um, you know, it's, it's premature to even try to define life. I mean, before we had chemistry, we could sort of describe, say, water. We could say, oh, it's, it's sort of wet and it's kind of clear and it's this and that, but we didn't know what it was until we knew what atoms were and how molecules formed and that it was H2O and, you know, like just to kind of get at these kind of underlying principles of what what life is. I just think it'd be so transformational, you know, better than anything some pharmaceutical company could come out of, you know, like I just- So we have one example that. now, but if we have multiple examples, we'll learn a lot more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's also a question about perseverance. We'll have ingenuity, which is the helicopter. And the question is how can it fly? You know, it's a real thin atmosphere. The, the rotors spin fast to produce the lift. And the idea, it's a, it's a technology experiment that will last a few weeks. Uh, that is really a precursor to more complex um, capabilities in terms of flight that, that we'll have on other planets um, and also on Titan. And then another question is what's, what's happening next on Venus? Venus has been kind of um, a little bit down in terms of missions from NASA. You know, the, the last one from NASA was Magellan, which was an orbiter with radar we mapped the surface. And now we understand that it's volcanically active and has nothing, nothing similar to Earth in terms of the, the volcanism and the tectonics. But that was in the 80s and 90s. And by the way, the, um, the icon, the, the kind of patch that you get from NASA with the, the mission information on it, that was developed by a freshman in my solar system class in 1988, I think, or 87, based on a national contest. And that's, the Magellan was the name. And if you look at the, the little badge, it has a, um, a Spanish ship on it, uh, but flying through the solar system, which is kind of interesting. But the helicopter basically just spins fast in terms of, and has a lot of lift right, in order to, and it doesn't weigh that much uh, in terms of mass. And of course, the, the Mars gravity is one third of Earth gravity. So we'll see how it happens. It should be pretty exciting. It's a, it's a new technology and a precursor. There's another question uh, from a person who was on the, the campus, who, it says 19, 1907, but I think it must mean the 1970s. Uh, and some moon rocks made their way to Wash U. Uh, yes, uh, they came back with the Apollo mission, um, missions, three, like 800 pounds of rocks. And the question is, will we bring samples back from Mars to Earth? Yes. That's one of the key things for perseverance. You know, we're gonna bring back drill cores sometime in the next um, 10 years, perhaps. There will be a subsequent mission. And then Sarah, what are you gonna do with those drill cores if they get into your lab? You know, uh, you we're gonna hit them with everything we've got, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I just think it'd be such a tremendous opportunity just you know, like the, the instruments that we send on spacecraft, you know, they're as sophisticated as we can make them, but of course they have to survive the really punishing space environment where you get these huge thermal swings, you've got the radiation, you've got all kinds of things, but, um, and they have to be small and light and not take a lot of power because you have to launch them up on rockets and get them very, very long trajectories to reach their destination. But, um, but the idea of just being able to like plug in these big instruments, you know, that are like the size of refrigerators and be able to go after them and then look for these biosignatures, it's just going to be a real game changer, I think. Right. I mean, it's a mission that keeps on giving, right? Because you, as instruments evolve, you can do more and more detailed work. And that's happening with the samples brought back by Apollo. So another question, are we nervous about Perseverance landing safely? Are you nervous? <laughs> yeah, I am nervous. Yeah, it's a, it's a seven minute activity and there's no way to control it. It's all automatic. Uh, so you have to enter the atmosphere at miles per second 
and land at half a yard per second. So you do an aero shield, you do a hypersonic parachute and this uh, thing called the sky crane with the rover attached underneath it. And when the sky crane is like 30 yards above the surface, the, the rover is, is left down on cables, wheels first, and hopefully lands at, at a, a yard per second very gently. It worked with curiosity. I think will work with, with um, perseverance. You get what you pay for. That's just really, really well done and tested. So I think- I mean, as engineers, it takes you out working with Abby. I mean, all of her yeah. colleagues are why we've got that. I mean, I think I'm less nervous than I was with Curiosity because we'd never tried out that sky screen before, but there are, there are new things, you know, there's this range trigger technology, the terrain relative navigation, you know, all of these advances that are going to put the rover down like right next to the geodolic target instead of like way far away where it's safe to land. So we're going to, you know, the community is going to have the scientific data back so quickly. I think it's, it will um, happen, Sarah, but it's so, so many things have to, to happen in sequence over the seven minutes from entering the atmosphere to the surface. Hey, there's a question about methane. Can you talk about methane on Mars and who thinks that's there and who doesn't? And how oh, um, that's a great question. One of the um, most exciting things, and one of the things we've been working really hard on with the, the SAM team, the sample analysis at Mars team on Curiosity. Um, so, the methane that we have on Earth, you know, 90% of it is from biological sources, and there's about 10% that's from geologic sources. And so the detection on Mars has been really fascinating because it means one of two things. Like one, there's life or there was ancient life that these kind of tiny exhalations are still coming, but there's such a short lifetime of methane in the atmosphere, only a couple hundred years, that these have to be continually replenished. So either there's some sort of hydrothermal process or volcanic process that's bringing this methane to the fore, or maybe there's some ancient clathrates that are sort of melting, or there's on the other hand, some sort of a geologic possibility that we just don't understand that Mars is more geologically active than we know. And so it's bedeviled our community for 50 years. You know, back in the late 60s, there was an, a published paper saying, you know, we found methane by the South Pole, but then it was retracted a month later. In the early 2000s, there are these telescopic from Hawaii and Chile, there were these telescopes and they, they found these plumes of methane. Then there was a Mars Express detection that was in the 2003, 2004, but then it suddenly disappeared. And, uh, and now with Curiosity, we found it again using the SAM instrument. And we've even found this kind of seasonal cycle, but of course up in orbit, there's this really sophisticated instrument called the Trace Gas Orbiter, and it's not seeing it at these high altitudes. And so what's happening like at the surface and are there diurnal effects or what, what, where is that mismatch? And critically, like, where is it coming from? I think it's well, one of the biggest mysteries. Of ongoing life in the subsurface, but we don't know at this point. We don't know, we don't know. And of course, you know, it's that same Sagan thing, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so we'll always sort of side with the kind of geologic claim until we're sure we can really prove biology. But even then, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It means that Mars is more geolo geologically active than we realize. And, and I think there's a lot to go after there. So Sarah, I'm getting a, a poking from Jenna, who's been adding me on, on questions. And I think we just had the last question. So this has been fantastic. It's like talking to you during our um, advising sessions during your four <laughs> years. So you can see folks how excited we are with one another and also the, the kinds of um, research tasks that we're involved in. And Abby also was just fantastic and has shot up in the management structure within planetary exploration and also science-wise. So this has been fantastic, Sarah, and we have to get together soon if um, uh, once we, we actually can do this without masks and vaccinations and everything else. I know. I'll come to St. Louis. I miss watching you. <laughs> I'll come say webinar. hi to you and Eloise. Oh, very, very much. This has been a treat for both of us. And the questions have been just fantastic. So thank you very much. Oh, oh well, thank you, Ray. This has been such an honor to be on this virtual stage with you. <laughs> and I see some former Pathfinders and Hewitt students, Sarah.
logging in. Oh, I want to look at the chat. I know it's just so exciting to. Oh, this is great. Look at all these people. Oh my gosh, these are some people I haven't talked to in like ten years. Hello, old friends. <laughs> look at this. Oh, I wish we could go on, right? But are they? They're definitely cutting us off. I guess that's happening. Yeah. Um, 